23, Luke 23, let's read uh, just a few verses, verses 13 through 16. Luke 23, beginning at verse 13, And Pilate, who had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people, and behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things where ye accuse him. No, no, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. And uh, we'll just consider these verses tonight. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on our Bible study. Lord, we love you and thank you for the opportunity to come and, and uh, take a, a break from the uh, cares of our life and, and all the things that uh, demand our attention, Lord, but certainly nothing ought to be more uh, important to us than your word. And I pray, God, that uh, as we study these things, our hearts will be challenged as we see what our Savior went through and the uh, shame and uh, humiliation that was uh, brought upon him that we deserved. I pray, God, that, that uh, it might challenge us to, uh, to boldly stand and have a testimony for Christ that matters in this world. And we know that there are many that uh, yield and compromise the truth of Scripture. But, Lord, help us to be like that tree planted by rivers of water that when the, uh, the winds blow and the rain falls, that tree is going to stand because its roots are sunk deep. And uh, Lord, so may our faith be strong and deep in the Word of God. And it won't happen unless we know our Bible. Uh, and any expression of, of confidence in the Word of God without uh, a commensurate knowledge of it is is uh, pretty feeble on our part. So help us to study, to so show ourselves and prove to God workmen that need not to be ashamed. And uh, Lord, we just ask that you meet with us and uh, challenge our hearts through these things as we look at it tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, well, first of all, we want to see uh, Pilate's irresponsibility. Then we're going to see his injustice. His, first of all, his irresponsibility. Uh, the Roman governor uh, that uh, was, was uh, a man that was charged with the administration primarily of the civil and military uh, affairs in the province of Judea and Samaria uh, on behalf of the Roman Senate, really the Roman Empire. And uh, that's, uh, that's what the Roman governor's job was. He was also a judge, but in a slightly... There were things, other things that uh, could be appealed to. There were other Roman officials that were above him, but in Judea and in Samaria, he, he was very powerful. Now, uh, he had, he had uh, uh, a great deal of power and authority, but it wasn't, like I said, uh, unlimited power and authority. Uh, he, didn't, he couldn't go anywhere in the Roman Empire and have power and authority, but there in Judea, uh, he had power and authority. Now, his, uh, his, the place where he resided, it wasn't in Jerusalem, it was in Caesarea, uh, which was north of Jerusalem and uh, along the coast of the Mediterranean. But whenever there was problems in Jerusalem, or, or uh, usually when there was feast days or something like that, then the Roman governor would usually go down to Jerusalem. But, but uh, generally speaking, the, the Roman uh, governors, they, they remained aloof, and they didn't really mix and mingle with the Jews any more than they had to. Uh, they, they, they didn't like the Jews, and the Jews didn't like them, so they kind of avoided each other. Um, Pontius Pilate was the fifth Roman ruler appointed over Judea. Now, he, I think I probably said a few weeks ago that he was procreator. That actually was, was a mistake. He, he was a prefect. Procreators were above prefects. And uh, so I don't really know maybe uh, what, what the big difference is. Uh, a prefect is like a governor, and a procreator would be like a, a vice president, a prime minister, something like that. In any, ways, uh, in any case, uh, they... they uh, that's, that was his official title. There, there is a stone that they found in Caesarea that uh, um, it was a block, 
and it was used in a wall. And uh, eventually they had to remove the wall. And when they removed the wall on the backside of the wall, they found the inscription. This stone had been in another building, and it said it was the building was dedicated in honor to uh, Caesar Tiberius uh, by the pre by the prefect Pontius Pilate. And uh, that that stone I think was uh, discovered by archaeologists in 1961. And uh, so that's why they know that he was a prefect and not a procreator because it's chiseled into that stone. And one would, one would assume that he had that done himself. Uh, he exercised his appointment from uh, the 26 AD to 36 AD, a period of about 11 years. And uh, really history, if you look at it just apart from what the Bible has to say about him, the Bible certainly isn't kind to him either, but... Uh, history is not very kind to what, what it, its opinion of Pontius Pilate. And he's mentioned by quite a number of different uh, Roman and uh, Jewish historians, and they're all pretty much unanimous that he was not a particularly nice guy. And uh, the Hel Hellenistic historian, you know, when, when you use the term, somebody uses the term Hellenist, you understand that term? Uh, a Hellenist was a... Jew who adopted Greek culture. So that the, the another way that they would say it is a Grecian. A Grecian. They would say either a Hellenist or a Grecian. A Grecian is not a Greek. A Greek is a Greek. But a Grecian was a Jew who adopted Greek culture. So, you know, it'd be kind of a, like, you know, uh, I don't know what they call them in Japan, Jado Kyopos. Is a or or uh, Chosunjo in 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 China the Koreans who kind of have lost their Korean identity and taken another identity um, and that's that's what uh, this guy was and his name's Philo he's a historian Philo portrays him as a, and he Philo lived at the same time as Philo portrays him as a as a man of of character. Uh, maybe even stubborn character, yet a man who was given to corrupting influences. And uh, certainly he was a man who was cruel and also coarse. He was not considered to be an overly polite man. He was uh, considered to be kind of uh, a coarse and offensive at times to most everybody who knew him. He often mistreated the people to whom he was supposed to administer justice uh, on behalf of Rome. And uh, like, most, uh, like most of the political leaders uh, of any age, uh, he was far more concerned with his own interests than he was the interests of the people that he was governing. Uh, and so he didn't uh, do a very good job as a governor. Uh, number two, Judea. I think we should understand that Judea was really a profitable region as far as Rome was concerned. The, 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 the Roman Caesars, they loved to spend money. And they loved, they loved the fancy buildings that they built in Rome, and uh, they, they have all kinds of ways in which they could spend money. And uh, that necessitated a pretty uh, consistent income of money in the form of taxes. Well, the land of Israel is that connection bridge between southern Europe and North Africa. Uh, you either have to ship it across the Mediterranean, which was always risky, because storms blow up in the Mediterranean and lots and lots of ships have been sunk with their holes full of valuable things. Uh, so the, the, the safer route then is a land route that goes through the land of Israel. Well, the Jews became pretty good at trading, and uh, they, they made a lot of money. Well, because they made a lot of money, then they also paid a lot of taxes. And uh, so, as far as Rome was concerned, uh, Judea was a very profitable region. And that's why, uh, really, Judea was the only place where the people were allowed to pretty much practice their religion however they wanted to. And uh, the, the Jews, uh, um, the Jews were monotheistic. 
That means they, they worshipped only one God. Uh, just as, as Deuteronomy said, the Lord our God is one God. But the Romans were, were uh, polytheistic, and uh, so they, the Roman religion made little sense to the, uh, uh, the, the, the Romans had trouble understanding the Jewish religion. And, uh, but the Romans wanted to keep that wealth flowing through the land of Palestine, and in order to do, do that, do that in order to keep the gravy train flowing, as it were, uh, they recognized the need to be at least a little bit tolerant uh, to the Jews' sensitivities. And that's why most of the Roman governors before Pilate, uh, the Roman soldiers all carried these, uh, put these medallions, and they would put them on their breastplate, they would put them uh, on their shields, and sometimes they would also put them on the hilts of their sword that bore an image of Caesar. But to the Jews, that was idolatry. And they got really upset about that. I mean really upset. And so the governors before Pilate, uh, they, they told the soldiers to remove those things while they were in the land of Israel. Uh, but Pilate didn't do that uh, at first, and there, there was lots of rioting that took place. And finally, he had to give in and uh, told the soldiers to remove those things. But he always resented that. He, he resented the, the people that he was ruling, telling him what to do. And uh, so there was never, never any uh, um, love between Pilate and the Jews. If, uh, you know, if there were repeated uh, reports from the Jews complaining to Caesar in Rome about what was going on, then, then uh, well, Pilate stood to lose his, lose his place. And uh, that is eventually what, what happened. Um, so Pilate, uh, he acted irresponsibly, uh, really for a man who had so much authority in the matter of Christ. He acted irresponsibly because he said on four different occasions, I find this man innocent. Nevertheless, he ultimately condemned him. And that's irresponsibility, don't you think? I mean, when you say that you believe something, and you say it four times, but after four times, you go ahead and, and go contrary to what you avow, you're acting irresponsibly as well. And uh, that's, uh, that's what Pilate did. He acted very irresponsibly that way. Now, understanding the political background, I think, can help us to see why Pilate acted in the irresponsible way that he did. Now, this is probably something you might get tired of hearing me stress, but I'm going to keep on saying it because there is such a growing movement these days among newer Calvinists uh, that have this idea that everything that we do has been determined by God from before the foundations of the world. And so I strenuously reject the notion that Pilate could not have done anything other than exactly what he did because God had determined it from before the foundation of the world. Listen, if God, if God programmed Pilate to do what he did, then Pilate isn't really responsible for his sin. Now, the, the, the Calvinist will say, oh, but yes, he is. He couldn't have done anything else. He had no free will. And he's 100% responsible for all the wrong that God made him do. Listen, if you believe that, I think that you have a pretty disturbing idea of the love of God. That's what I think. I don't find that in my Bible at all. I never find a verse in the Bible that says God makes people to sin, and then they have to bear the responsibility for their sin. If, if I make my children steal and beat them if they don't steal, is it really them then that are doing it, or am I the one who's accountable for their actions? Well, a couple of fingers are being pointed at me because they're saying, no, that's not me, that's him, he made me do it. He's bigger than me. God's bigger than us. Listen, if somebody bigger than you made you do something that's wrong simply because they could, 
you wouldn't feel that you should have to bear the penalty of it. And uh, I think that's what the Bible teaches as well. So uh, I think to suggest that, that uh, God could be at least uh, partially responsible for Pilate's um, a weak and uh, sinful actions is, is definitely wrong. Uh, God certainly knew all that Pilate would do. God knows every sin that you're going to commit. He knew every sin that you've already committed. He knows the sins that you're going to commit tomorrow. He knows the sins that you're going to commit next year. God knows those things. But just because God knows what you're going to do does not mean that God determined that you should do that. God did not constrain Pilate to sin when he failed to administer justice to Jesus Christ. Now, are we glad that Jesus went to the cross, that Pilate sent Jesus to the cross to pay the penalty? Yeah. Does that mean that Pilate should get a pass? No, he shouldn't. No, he shouldn't. He should have done what's right. You should do what's right. That's right. I should do what's right. God tells us in his word what is right. The only question is, will we do it? Will we walk in obedience to the word of God? Will we do what's right? God's sovereignty is not limited because we are sinful. And that may be the crux of the issue between, between hyper-Calvinism and, and, and biblical uh, doctrine is the sovereignty of God. Because hyper-Calvinism says that if we have a free will, then God isn't sovereign. God is still sovereign. Whether I, whether I am in submission to him or not, God is still sovereign. He's still sovereign. So, uh, just a, a few thoughts there about the uh, irresponsibility of, of Pilate. But let's, uh, let's think also tonight about his injustice. Although Pilate repeatedly found Jesus innocent of, of the charges leveled against him, the Roman governor bowed to the pressure put on him by the Jewish, loss, uh, by the Jewish leadership. And, you know... I think uh, some of the most powerful men in the world end up doing the same thing. They end up bowing, usually to the loudest voice. The loudest voice, I think I say this later, is seldom the right voice. You know, first Pilate uh, declared an intent to hear, uh, uh, to, to beat Christ, and then to release him. Think about that. Isn't that grossly inconsistent? I, I find this man innocent, therefore I'm going to just beat the fire out of him and let him go. If Jesus was innocent, then why beat him? If, if he said this man didn't do anything wrong, but we're just going to go ahead and haul off and just beat the tar out of him, you know, evidently the beating was an attempt to placate the Jews. But it was certainly contrary to uh, Roman law as well as the law of Moses, uh, by which the Jews themselves uh, were governed. And uh, so that was certainly an injustice on the part of, of, of Pilate. Uh, Pilate even affirmed that uh, Herod had examined the Lord Jesus and also found him innocent of all that the Jewish council had accused him of. Now, in, in uh, 36 AD, Pilate sent Roman troops up into uh, Samaria against uh, a reputed uprising of Samaritans. Uh, he was told that some, some Samaritans were rising up in, in rebellion against, armed rebellion against Rome, and so he sent, he sent a bunch of Roman troops in there. And uh, this uh, group of Samaritans had gathered, uh, uh, supposedly, to see some... Uh, buried artifacts that have allegedly been hidden by Moses in the ruins of the temple at Mount Gerizim. Now, you remember the, 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 when Jesus met the woman at the well? 
And that Jesus said to her, Jesus said to her, go and tell thy husband, get thy husband. In. And she said, I don't have a husband. And he said, yeah, you don't have a husband, all right. You've had five husbands, and the guy you got right now is your husband. And she said, uh, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> Then she, then she did what we, we like to do. She changed the subject. <laughs> and she said, the Jews say that you have to worship God in Jerusalem, uh, but we worship Him here at Mount Gerizim. And, uh, you know, so there was the, Jew, the Samaritans, uh, when, when the Jews were rebuilding the temple uh, under, under Ezra, the, the scribe, uh, the Samaritans said, hey, we're going to come and help you. Remember Sambalat and Tobiah, those guys? And they, they said, no, you're not going to come and help us. You've got nothing to do with this. You know what they did? They went and built their own, built their own temple at Mount Gerizim. And uh, um, Mount Gerizim, uh, some, some years after that was built, during the time of the Maccabeans, uh, they went and they destroyed that temple, the Maccabeans after they gained rule and independence from the uh, Seleucid kings of Syria, they went up and they destroyed the temple at Mount Gerizim. And the, the, so the Samaritans were pretty bitter at the Jews for having done that. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, they, 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 this story went around that, uh, you know, there was some, they had discovered some artifacts that Moses himself had hidden at Mount Gerizim. Now, Think about that. Just a second. You know, did Moses ever set foot in Mount Gerizim? No. But because Moses died before the children of Israel ever crossed the Jordan River, God buried him at Mount Ebal, which is on the other side of the Jordan River. So and that was kind of crazy that they believed that to begin with. But in any case, the Roman soldiers went up there and they slaughtered a great number of uh, of Samaritan pilgrims, and they uh, they captured their leaders, then tortured and killed them. And uh, you know, it, it's possible. Uh, I don't think that anybody can prove this, but it's it's maybe more than possible. Uh, how did uh, how do you think Pilate heard about those Samaritans? I think there's a pretty good chance the Jews told. Them. I think the Jews sent somebody up there and said, "Hey." Pilate, listen, there's a whole bunch of Samaritans doling out swords and building an army. You got to get over there and take care of it. And uh, so he did, and he killed a bunch of people. So the Samaritans then went to the um, the governor of Syria. He was a prefect, or not a prefect. Actually, he was even above all of um, What did I say the other one was? Procreator. Procreator. He was above a procreator. So he definitely was Pilate's boss. And uh, he didn't really like Pilate. And so he ordered Pilate to return to Rome uh, for an accounting of it. And however, shortly after Pilate returned to Rome, uh, Tiberius died. The Roman governor Tiberius died. And uh, his nephew Caliglia became the next emperor, also in the Bible calls him Gaius, and uh, Gaius didn't like most of the people that um, Tiberius liked, and he deposed most of them, and he deposed uh, Pilate, and, uh, and uh, he uh, sent him to Gaul, uh, which seems to be where everybody that uh, gets deposed uh, by Rome ends up in Gaul. In this case, uh, uh, I think it was somewhere in uh, northern Italy, but uh, he's reported supposedly to have died in, uh, in Vienna, possibly by poisoning. And uh, there are some really crazy stories out there that the Catholics uh, perpetrated during the Middle Ages about Pontius Pilate. Uh, the, the, the one that seems to bounce around a lot among uh, Catholic sources is that uh, a pilot, his body was thrown into the river in Rome, which I think is the Tiberius River. 
but their, uh, the water just bubbled up and kicked his body back on land. And so that river didn't want his body. So then they took his body to a, a river up in northern Italy and threw it in there, and the same thing happened. And uh, then they took his body to a lake in Lursine and uh, threw it in, and the same, it, same thing happened. It kept bubbled up. We lost it again. Well, we're almost finished, so I will just uh, turn this off and uh, you don't have to see it then. Except for 7 6. In any case, when his body was thrown into the river, they, they decided that they didn't want to take it anywhere else, and so they weighted it down with lead and it sank to the bottom. However, on Good Friday every year, his body rises so that he can wash his hands again. The, aren't some of the stories that the Catholics come up with just wild? They're, they're crazy. So uh, uh, that's, uh, that's some crazy things about Pilate. But let's just uh, finish real quick with this, and then we'll go pray. But uh, some modern Bible translations uh, and verse 15, uh, look back in your Bible at verse 15. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Some modern Bibles purposefully mistranslate verse 15. And if you have a, a modern version of the Bible, uh, something other than the King James Version, maybe the New American Standard or New International Version or NESP, something like that, it'll say something like, No, nor yet Herod. For he sent him back to us, and lo, nothing worthy of death it is done unto him. And by changing the verse on the basis of really only a few very corrupted uh, manuscripts, some scholars now allege that verse number ten must be an addition that was added that was added many years later, maybe 150 years after the fact in order to harmonize the passage. Do you see verse number 10? Uh, I don't think we read number 10, but in verse number 10, uh, the chief priests and scribes, this is at the hearing before Herod, stood and vehemently accused him. So because they mistranslate one verse, because it's three or four of the 5,000 or so existing uh, handwritten manuscripts of the Bible, because three or four of them uh, have... Did, got it wrong. Uh, they they say the you know the five thousand are wrong, the three or four are right, and uh, they then they uh, you know change it. But when they change it, then it becomes necessary to say that verse number ten was added, and it wasn't in the original text. It was added some years later, and uh, it's it's kind of a circle. When you start doubting God's word. When you start doubting the doctrine of preservation and you start setting yourself up as judge over God's word, it's a, it's, it's a circle that just keeps going around and keeps getting bigger and bigger. And it certainly has nothing to do with faith. Because Jesus said, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot, that's the smallest Hebrew letter, one tittle, that's like the, that's like the, the crossing of a small T or the, the crossing of a, of a small F. One jot or one tittle shall in no eyes pass from the lost, and all is fulfilled. So Jesus promised his word would never pass away. But the scholars don't believe the, 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 the promises of Jesus. So um, uh, be, be careful about those, those new versions, whether it's in English or, or whether it's uh, a, a Korean Bible translated from corrupted texts. Be careful about that. Uh, if, if the people who are doing the translation do not believe First of all, in the divine inspiration of Scripture. And second of all, in the providential preservation of Scripture, the product is not going to be very good. It's not going to be very good. So, uh, the, Word of God is, the Word of God is a divine book. It's not like Shakespeare's manuscripts. It's not like Homer's manuscripts. This is the Word of God. And Jesus said that His Word... It's like silver, tried in the furnace of the earth seven times, and it shall 
never pass away. Never pass away. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's close in prayer and then.